I wish I had partnered up earlier, spent 15 years or so doing the lone wolf activity, building up my, my portfolio. The last four years, as I've worked with teams, my growth has accelerated much more quickly. And so I would just say the sooner you can join hands with somebody that's more successful than you, that you can link up with mentorship, somebody as ambitious as you, the better. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Brad Shepard has experience both in development and management of retail and hospitality properties. He's raised capital from both domestic and international investors. I'm excited to jump in on the international side and hear how that went for you, Brad. Uh, and he's also been exclusively focused on capital raising for commercial projects since 2017. Brad, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks a lot, Sam. Great to be here. Hey, man. Pleasure's mine. Same three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show. Can you very quickly tell us where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Yeah, started back in college. Um, did a finance degree, you know, intending to get into commercial real estate. I interned with a large commercial uh, firm up in Seattle. Hmm. Loved it. Um, life took me a different direction. So I didn't go that commercial route, but I ended up, you know, as soon as I got out of college, I started buying my own rental properties. Um, been, you know, that was literally 20 years ago. Um, four years ago, r really wanted to switch out of residential and get back into co commercial and started looking at, you know, buying my own apartment, self-storage, et cetera. And then was able to find this little niche in just working with successful operators in r helping them raise capital and bring investors to the table. And it's been really fun. So that's where I'm at today. Um, still have my own, you know, of my own rental portfolio, but yeah, the, the, definitely the focus is on the large commercial deals at this point. Gotcha. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, you can, you can, and there's people, you know, I've had, I've had people on this show that own 400, 800, a thousand single family homes and, you know, they figured out a way to scale it, but I think the path to scaling that is much, much more ambiguous maybe than it is to buy right. 300 units at a time. You're like, Oh, okay. This, this makes more sense. Yeah. Uh, more, more power to them for figuring it out. Yeah. And I, I never, I couldn't do it either. Like I tried, I, I, I really honestly tried. And, and in the end, I just fell flat on my face. Like this is, I just, I didn't have the systems or something wasn't right to where so many houses, so many people, so many tenants, it just didn't make sense. Right. Right. So that's a, that's a cool journey. You know, talk to us about how, when you, when you transitioned, what was the, what was the moment where you said, Hey, you know what, I'm onto something and here's the way I'm going to do it. Yeah. So, you know, my wife and I, we, we originally from Utah, that's where we had our original rental portfolio. We moved it to Austin, Texas 10 years ago. Hmm. And there we tried to do some more active stuff like fix and flips, um, some wholesaling and, you know, had fun with it, but realized, man, I, I, I really don't like this. Right. <laughs> I really don't like picking out paint colors and tile <laughs> and, you know, hurting around uh, contractors. And, and, and so, you know, finally it dawned on me, like, you know, what, what am I doing this stuff for? And we, at the same point, we were kind of experiencing some, some hiccups with some of our uh, single family, you know, the, the typical rentals, the long-term standard rentals. And we had some Airbnbs going and whatnot, and those were okay. Um, but it, you know, it just, it just took a lot of work. And so the question we were asking ourselves, we were, as we're getting into our forties, do we really want to be doing this much activity? Right. When we've got these little young kids that we're trying to take care of, we want more time with them. What, what do we do? And so it finally dawned on me. I don't know why it took me this long, but it dawned on me, get back into commercial. Mm -hmm. And you know, that I saw that as a way to simplify, come up to kind of a higher scale, work more with professional property managers, professional contracting groups. And it just was really attractive. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. How did you figure out your strategy of just becoming a capital raiser? So, uh, you know, I started talking to brokers, started talking to, you know, the, the commercial brokers starting to get on their buyer's list, looking at deals, started thinking about who would I need? What, what I realized quickly was that it's a team sport right. doing the, everything else I had done to that point. It was me and my wife and something, you know, one or two, I had a partner on just for fun because we liked each other. But when you get in the commercial space, I realized, okay, I, you know, I can't do everything here. Right. And so as I started just to network with people in the space and thinking about, you know, you know, where could we focus? I focus on one thing. You focus, maybe you focus on operations, maybe you focus on sourcing, you focus on the brokers. I focus on the whatever, whatever working with these operators, you know, the consistent theme was need help raising capital, need help raising capital. And started to look around, are there other people that are doing this focused exclusively on the capital raising side? And of course there are. And then it just 
you know, turn on light bulbs for me. You know, maybe I could use a finance degree to, you know, in, in, in a different way than just, yeah, you know, the, 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 what I had originally thought. So use that finance degree just to focus on putting together these attractive portfolios, these attractive opportunities and being able to present them well to potential investors. Yeah. And um, so far, you know, the rest is history. It's been great. That's, that, that, that's fantastic. How, how did you select, or maybe they selected you, the first group to work with? So again, I'm recognizing it was a team sport you know, started to talk to these operators who were already doing well and found out what are they doing for their extra capital needs when they're short, who do they contact? Mm-hmm. Well, I reached out to them and talked, started talking to them about opportunities to work together. And so again, just recognizing it as a team sport and wanted to just connect with people who were already successful doing you know, this type of work. And that's where it took off. So learn from them. Um, we've evolved. Um, we set up our own, we, as of about a year and a half ago, we went and got the, we went the broker dealer route. Okay. Um, so now fully licensed to be able to do it up and up on, um, you know, fully compliant, but uh, yeah, it was def- definitely a process starting again with just networking within the, within the industry itself. All right. I'm excited about this. The broker dealer route. This is not something I've had anyone come on the show and actually talk about. I actually have a guest. I know that's scheduled tomorrow that I was going to have this conversation with. So now I'll get to compare uh, that <laughs> one of the things we had talked about. So maybe I'll right. get to compare notes on both sides of this. It's not a common path inside of, uh, you know, the, the real estate capital raising side. A lot of us, uh, a lot of people are kind of, you know, work in the gray area where it's like, hey, wait, you know, am I capital raising? Am I part of the general partnership and I actually part of the management or am I just on the general partnership label and I'm not really doing anything day to day? Right. And you decided, you said, hey, you know what? We're going to remove all ambiguity. I'm going to go to the broker dealer route. What's been that like? And tell us why you did it and then tell us what are some of those restrictions or benefits of doing it. Yeah. So originally we, we operated in that, in that gray area, like, Hey, you know, we'll, we'll come in with a creative arrangement, bring, make us part of the general partnership. We'll talk about how we help with the due diligence, how we help with the investor relationships ongoing. And um, you know, that, and that's where a lot of people operate to this day and you have to get kind of creative and there's been, but there's been more um, an effort on the sec side to enforce some of the rules there. And in fact, me and a lot of people I work with, we all got letters in, I think it was late 2019 or right, right before COVID hit saying, you know, letter, letters from the SEC saying, Hey, we're not, not announcing anything, but we're just, we just be aware we're, we're, we're watching. <laughs> and once we got that letter, it's like, all right, no more, no more funny business. How do we do this? Right. And so we went back to the attorneys. We went back to our securities attorneys and talked about, you know, what is the best way to structure this? And the consistent theme from all the attorneys that we talked with was the broker dealer route. Mm-hmm. And so then we were able to find a, a broker dealer sponsor um, to, to, to work with. I'm a registered representative of a broker dealer. I had to go out there and get a couple, pass a couple securities tests, get my, get licensed. I have to be licensed in every state where a potential investor sits so I can have a, a legal conversation with them, but that cleaned up everything. And so now my relationship with the, the general partnerships and the operators is just very clean. I'm being paid a, a cut of the money that I raise, just like any other broker dealer out there. They bring money to Fidelity. They bring money, money to Schwab. They place a life insurance. They get a cut, they get a commission, exact same. So, um, you know, I have to do it in the investor's best interest. That's the, the, the standard we're held to. Um, but with a very clear, um, responsible, highly ethical uh, approach to it. And it just simplified everything. I just took away all the gray area, which helps me sleep better at night. Do you still participate on the general partnership side or are you just raising capital and that's it? Yeah. Once we went the broker dealer route, it's just done the capital raising side. So we're no longer trying to we, you know, wiggle our way into the, the general partnership paperwork. Got it. Okay. Now that's really interesting because that's, that's a strategic move. You know, for some of us, we do, uh, or say, you know, the capital raising side to eventually work our way into, you know, being our own general partner. It's just kind of a stepping stone along the way. Like sure. okay, I helped raise money and then I took down a small deal and I took down a big deal. And it's just kind of the, this linear progression. But for you, you said, you know what, that's fine. I can go out and I can raise for a hundred deals and I can just put money in each of these deals and it doesn't really, it doesn't matter. I just take a cut of it and then I move forward and that's it. 
is that kind of the thinking there or can you yeah you know my original intention i was talking to these brokers like hey i want to look at these i you know send me something 250 units and above these kind of parameters and you know realizing it, it's that's you know pr a professional effort full-time effort and i applaud the operator operating teams that are out there doing it. i'm cheering them on i want them to be successful but it turns out you know for my skill set my finance degree, my personal situation with my wife and kids, being able to focus simply on the capital raising side, relying on operators who are sophisticated, already proven to be successful. They have the systems in place. What it just dawned on me, I like, I can compete against these guys or work with them. Right. So how about I work with them? And it, it, yeah, you know, if it was part of the general partnership and a deal goes phenomenal, you know, they're going to be the biggest winners out of, out of the, out of the end of the process, but we get paid handsomely on the capital raising side as well. And with, without, without the responsibility on my shoulders of the, you know, of the, of the daily operations and right. you know, it just right. suits my lifestyle fantastically. How do you, how do you protect yourself? Cause I'm assuming that, I mean, you plug these people into the investment, but then you're turning over all their information to that sponsor in the end. Right. Because oh, sure. I, I mean, as far as like losing relate, losing contact or losing the relationship. Yeah, with that I mean, cause, Cause that point forward, then it's just like, Hey, you know, you turn, you turn me, you turn Sam Wilson over to, to sponsor X for deal one and then deal two. Now you're, you're having to, you know, reinvent the milk cow every time. You know, right. Next deal. How do, how do you work around that? certainly the potential exists, but that would quickly sour the relationship with the operator. And if we've done a good job and they see us as a strong partner that can bring the capital to them, help them get their deals across the finish line, they don't want to burn that bridge. Right. And it would burn the bridge if we find out that our, you know, the, the, all, all of a sudden they've gone direct to our investors. And of course we stay in touch with them. Um, you know, we, we we're doing a regular reach out. That's my job is just to really answer their questions, get them comfortable, stay in touch throughout the investment life cycle, throw a holiday party, you know, thank them for their, for their support, think, you know, celebrate the wins. And so, yeah, certainly possible that an operator could then just take their email address and, you know, run with them on the, on the next deal. Right. But then of course, you know, that would sour any potential opportunities to work together for going forward. Right. Then, then what about communications? Like, cause you know, typically when we get involved and I'm involved as an LP, as much as I am uh, a GP and, and, you know, you're getting all these, these inbound communications from the sponsor. Are you still staying in the middle on that and handling communications? Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little, um, relax around that. I, I, I like my investors to see the communication directly from the sponsors and I'm totally fine with that. They're going to get an extra layer of communication from me as well. And so if, if, a, if a sponsor is out there, you know, sending their monthly or quarterly update um, directly to my investors, I'm okay with that. Sure, but sure. then I'm going to put together um, a summary. I know what, I know the other deals that that investor is, is in and might be with other operators. And so I'm going to be communicating with that invest, investor directly about all their deals you know, uh, separately on a, on a regular cadence as well. So it's, I think they enjoy that. They, I think they enjoy hearing directly as well as con uh, consolidated. Here's how all your investments are doing this month. Right. Right. That's uh that's absolutely tremendous. I love that. Is there any hope for you? Do you ever foresee yourself becoming a full time or, or, or getting more on the active side uh, of real estate investment, or do you just want to stay in this lane for now? Yeah. You know, I, I never say never, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, a, a great little niche though, that we enjoy. My kids right now are five and two. And so when, um, just a few months ago, we actually moved from Austin to Boise. Wow. Um, still have our, you know, our rental properties are in Texas. And I'm, I'm looking here at the Boise market and seeing what's going on here. It's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's equal to, or greater than the activity and the appreciation that's going on in Austin. Yep. So I'm looking at like, all right, hey, maybe I need to make a play here some somewhere, but I'm feeling like it might, I might just, I might just wait for my kids to be a little bit older. I love the idea of showing my, my boys, the, the ropes, and it's a little easier to show them the ropes when you've got, when I can drive them out to a physical building and say, here, you know, here's what we're doing. Right. Then like, all right, here's, here's the wires and the PPMs and right. Right. <laughs> it's not quite as exciting for the little guys. It's really not. No, I hear you. Yeah. There's some, there's something about paperwork that doesn't excite a five-year-old. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh, that's really cool. That is very cool. Brad, I've certainly enjoyed today's conversation. Let's jump here into the final four questions. The first one is this, what is one tool or resource you find you can't live without? Um, I, I use, um, my, my email marketing platform is critical to be able to gather the email addresses and, and, and communicate on a regular basis, make notes in there, who gets what I use Aweber. Mm. I've been using that for 20 years. 
So I'm, maybe there's some better tools out there right now, but that's kind of my CRM, to be honest. And I definitely rely on that. Right. I love it. Question number two is this, if you could help our listeners avoid just one mistake in real estate, what would it be? And how would you avoid it? For me, I, I wish I had partnered up earlier, spent 15 years or so doing the lone wolf activity, building up my, my portfolio. The last four years, as I've worked with teams, my growth has accelerated much more quickly. And so I would just say the sooner you can join hands with somebody that's more successful than you, that you can link up with mentorship, somebody as ambitious as you, the better. Right. Right. I love that. When it comes to investing in the world, what's one thing you're doing right now, like right now to make the world a better place? My wife and I are really active in our, in our church community. We both have um, volunteer assignments, you know, so we're both, you know, like every, every week I show up with our, our youth, our, um, our, we call them our young men, you know, they're 12 to 13, 14 year olds that we help mentor and tutor and, and do fun activities with. And we, we enjoy that. That's cool. That's cool. Lastly, Brad, if our tip listeners want to get in touch with you, what is the best way to do that? Best way is to find us on our website, sugarhouseinvestments.com. Um, that's the best way to reach out to us though. I do. I haven't, I got into Twitter last six, seven months and it's been fun to hang out on there. So I'm a, at Brad Shep on Twitter and certainly welcome to connect with me there too. That's awesome. Brad, thank you for your time. I do appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Sam. Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you can do me a favor and subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen, if you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.